Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Tucker, and I am an Equal Opportunity Specialist with USDA NIFA Office of Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity. I will be your facilitator for today's diversity training covering USDA civil rights and equal opportunity programs. The objectives of this training is to ensure recipients of federal financial assistance are aware of the requirements of USDA civil rights and equal opportunity programs and related laws, rules, provisions, and civil rights concepts, as well as to gain an understanding of the minimal requirements it takes to be in compliance with federal rules, laws, and regulations. The civil rights laws I will be covering include Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Age Discrimination Act of 1975. All of these civil rights laws were established for the purpose of strengthening the initial Civil Rights Act of 1964. As you can see here, President Lyndon Johnson committed to signing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Before his assassination, President Kennedy strongly pushed for the Civil Rights Act. One of his most powerful quotes stated that, the rights of every man are diminished when the rights of one man is threatened. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was signed by President Lyndon Johnson on July 2nd, 1964. It prohibited discrimination in public places, provided for the integration of schools and other public facilities, and made employment discrimination illegal. It prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Provisions of this Civil Rights Act forbade discrimination based on sex as well as race in hiring, promoting, and firing. The act prohibited discrimination in public accommodations and federally funded programs. It also strengthened the enforcement of voting rights and the discrimination, the desegregation of schools. As stated, many of these acts, such as Title VI, were created to strengthen the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI states that no person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color or national origin in any program or activity that receives federal funds or other federal financial assistance. Programs that receive federal funds also cannot distinguish among individuals either directly or indirectly in the types, quantity, quality, or timeliness of program services, aids, or benefits that they provide or in the manner in which they provide the service. So basically the services or activities are to be provided in the same manner for everyone. For Title VI to apply, the program or agency must be located in the United States. 
It must be providing a service. And it also must be receiving direct recipient or indirect subrecipient federal funding or assistance. So what is a recipient? A recipient can be either primary or sub recipient. For example, the Ride Along Ranch Training Program receives funds from the, United, uh, the University of Alaska Fairbanks Extension Program to provide cowboy ethics training for its participants. The Ride Along Ranch Training Program is a subrecipient and is subject to Title VI rules and regulations. So although the Ride Along Ranch Training Program has been contracted by the University of Alaska Fairbanks Extension Program, they still must follow the rules under Title VI. The recipient is the entire program or activity. It exists when any part of the agency or institution receives federal financial assistance. For example, the University of Hawaii Extension Program receives federal financial assistance from USDA. Outside the Extension Program, the University of Hawaii also has a nursing program. Is a nursing program also subject to Title VI rules and regulations? Yes. Although the nursing program does not receive direct funding, it is a program within an organization that does. So who is protected under Title VI? Nonprofits, community or advocacy groups, all people documented and undocumented? Is it individuals or persons above the legal age? Or is it all US citizens? It's actually all people <clears throat> documented or undocumented. Person is a broad meaning that includes all residents, travelers, citizens, non-citizens, and undocumented individuals. In the United States, it's anywhere in the United States of America are all 50 states and its territories. Federal financial assistance includes grants, loans, below fair market value, the use of equipment, training, the detail of federal personnel, surplus property. So if a federal employee is providing civil rights training to extension program staff, that training is considered federal financial assistance. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act deals with employment. It is a section of the Federal Civil Rights Act that prohibits employment discrimination. The primary objective of anti-discrimination laws such as Title VII is to ensure that individuals are given equal opportunity in workplaces. The demographic characteristics that cannot be used for employment decisions are known as protected classes and are, are they're called protected classifications. Nearly all employers are covered by Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. This includes federal, state, and local governments, as well as private employers with at least 15 employees. Specifically, Title VII addresses employment discrimination in hiring, compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. It prohibits employers from discriminating against anyone based on that individual's race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Employers with 15 or more employees, including federal, state, local governments, employment agencies, and labor unions must abide by the, this law. 
It covers U.S. citizens and legal residents working for the U.S. companies in other countries. So if you are working for a company that is within the United States and you go overseas to work, you are still covered under Title VII. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, was created to provide Title VII oversight. It interprets the meaning of discrimination. It determines how to prove discrimination has occurred. It identifies remedies available in the law. It addresses how to reconcile rights. Some examples of potential Title VII failures are religious discrimination. So a person of a certain religious group has services refused or stricter requirements are imposed. Sex discrimination. A pregnant student is denied a position, although she is just as capable or more qualified than her counterparts. Retaliation. Programs, program staff get harassed because they filed a charge of discrimination, or maybe he or she participated in a discrimination process. Reverse race discrimination. Title VII prohibits race discrimination against all people, including Caucasians. A plaintiff may prove a claim of discrimination through direct or circumstantial evidence. Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972, EEO. This act specifies that an employer may not, because of a person's race, color, national origin, religion, or sex, refuse to hire, discharge, harass, otherwise discriminate against an individual with respect to compensation, terms, condition, or privileges of employment. EEO was passed by Congress as a fourth attempt to improve Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It expanded the investigative power of the Empl Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, to cover state and local governments. It gave the EEOC authority to sue in federal courts when it finds cause for employment discrimination. It expanded the protection of Title VII to public and private employers with 15 or more employees, both public and private labor organizations, and employment agencies. Title IX of the Education Amendments Act of 1972 states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX is a civil rights law that specifically addresses gender and education. Historically, Title IX was seen as having gender equity in sports. Title IX has always had a mandate to address sex discrimination in hiring, admission, and other aspects of school education programs. It is enforced and investigated by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. The new Title IX resources for students and institutions was established May 2020. It requires all universities to implement a grievance process. Violations of Title IX may be gender bias. Key research projects are given often more often to males than females sexual motivated verbal 
or nonverbal conduct. A male or female professor constantly touches graduate students in a sexual manner while verbally attempting to coerce graduate students to engage in sexual acts. Discrimination against pregnant or parenting students. Students with children are denied special projects due to an assumption of their non-availability. Creating a hostile educational environment. Female minority students within a university research program consistently feeling the pressure to perform at levels higher than their counterparts. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 states that no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States as defined in section 705 of this title, shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from the participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving fin federal financial assistance, or under any program or activity conducted by any executive agency or the United States Postal Service. Section 504 was the first national civil rights law providing equal access for students with disabilities to higher education institutions. It prohibits discrimination against otherwise qualified individuals because of their disability. It covers any qualifying physical or mental impairment that limits a major life activity, or it has a record of such an impairment, or is regarded as having such an impairment. It covers students with no educational needs, such as a wheelchair-bound student. It may require an accommodation or modification for a student to have equal access to an education. Some 504 examples include an extension program student diagnosed with ADHD has difficulties completing tasks in a timely manner. Even though that student does not require special education or related aids and services under 504, this student is protected from other forms of discrimination. This student may need additional time to complete assignments and or assistance staying on task. Another example is a research program student unable to walk stairs due to a disability cannot participate in a special project being conducted on the second floor. Because the building was constructed before June 4, 1977, the school is not required to make it accessible. The university is still responsible for ensuring the program conducting the special project is accessible for all students under Section 504. AIDS Discrimination Act of 1975. It states that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of age, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Some signs of age discrimination can include coded comments, extension program agents may say younger volunteers are energetic, fresh face, have new blood, while older volunteers are commented on saying they are set in their ways or have a certain mindset. And this can be considered discrimination. Different dealings, younger research program volunteers getting all or most opportunities for training, promotion, or a significant project compared to older research program volunteers who are passed over. And it could be vice versa. 
where an older research program volunteer can be given more training and research based on past work or relationships while not offering the same opportunity for research program volunteers due to their perceived lack of knowledge based on their age. Wounding words can be abusive at, enough to create a hostile work environment. Several age re related remarks either directed toward younger or older program participants or volunteers can make a worker feel uncomfortable. Ageist assumptions, comments that older participants don't understand technology and, and social media and can't work as hard as maybe the younger program participants. Well, that concludes my presentation. I have listed here three resources pertaining to civil rights laws and compliance that should be of value to you. The first website will direct you to the NIFA Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity web pages, where you will find staff contact information as well as other resources. If you have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to visit our website or contact our staff directly. Thank you for attending this training.